I am Lee Henson Hasty. I'm Senior Director of Theological Education Funds Development um, for the Presbyterian Foundation. Um, this is a ministry of the Committee on Theological Education, and that is a really long introduction, but Laura actually understands it maybe better than most uh, for a variety of reasons, um, including chairing a committee that helped create this space. Um, and I'm so grateful to her on so many levels. We've um, known each other since you were at McCormick and in uh, a variety of groups and formal and informal. I'm just, I've always been grateful for who you are, what you represent, um, the kind of wisdom and justice and truth that you speak and joy. <laughs> uh, cynicism with joy, it's, it's a rare gift and it's one that we need right now. I feel like a realistic, but yet hopeful. Um, so I think everybody, you're going to be love to get to know her. her. We're going to post her link to her bio. Um, Anna Pitney Strait is giving a shout out from Lewisburg, West Virginia. Um, but ex I think it's public accepting a call soon. Um, uh, we're so we're so excited uh, that you're here. Anybody else, let us know you're here. Um, we're going to be talking about race in America and um, welcome your questions. I mean, this is not just a question for the last two or three years since Black Lives Matter, right? <laughs> yeah, look at that smile. <laughs> um, but hopefully it's one that we're dealing with um, and uh, Laura is going to help us talk through that, especially with the church and church leaders today. So let us know you're here. Thanks, Laura, for being here. Thanks so much for having me. Always good to hang out. Yes, yes. Laura and Jessica are two of my my favorite folks to hang out with. They've hung out with us on the porch watching crazy parades and stuff like that. Yes, it was our uh, introduction to white culture on St. Patrick's Day. So I really appreciate you and Elizabeth for your hospitality. It was a sight. Super, super white culture. You got it. You got it right. Yes, it's, uh, there have, the la no, no St. Patrick's Day parades the last two years. Um, we'll, we'll see if they come back. Um, we're, we're, we're hoping because it's, it's an experience, uh, that's for sure. Um, Laura is the uh, vice president for admissions, vocation, and stewardship. Assistant dean. Assistant dean, okay, yeah. for, uh, for admissions, vocation, and stewardship at uh, the Divinity School at Vanderbilt. Uh, university that's in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, this is not a Presbyterian related school, but a lot of great Presbyterians uh, involved. I'm thinking of John McClure and Jim Hudnut Bumler and Laura Heifetz and students and others. Uh, a recent uh, PhD grad, Amy Moiso. I mean, I could go on for a long time. Some of my favorite people. Um, and she is um, uh, just involved in all. You know, you just, what What do you not do well? That's what I want to know. She fosters and takes care of dogs. I mean, I have critiques about what I'm not doing well when I stretch myself a little too thin. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, uh, I'm still the co-moderator of the special committee on per capita and financial sustainability since that has stretched out. Wow. Into the next two years, and I would like to give a shout out to my co-mod, Valerie Young, who is sometimes taking the bulk of the work <laughs> because yeah. I'm very like, uh, right. <laughs> with all my things. There's that. Yes. Oh, gosh. Yeah. A lot. It's a lot. Um, she also, y'all should know, is a wonderful exegete of scripture, a wonderful theologian, a great preacher. Uh, so invite her to speak. Keynote do something like that. Um, and you'll see why here, if you don't know Laura yet, you're gonna, you're gonna see why very soon. Uh, so I think, you know, I usually ask about call and I, lo I love how Howard Thurman asked that, um, what is it making, that's making you come alive? Or you might answer the Katie Geneva Cannon question. She says, what is it, um, what is the work that your soul must have? So Laura, I'd love to hear, um, you can answer that for, all time or for today or what, whatever is working for you? What is it, your work that your soul must have? I really think it's about the flourishing of people in the fullness of who they are. You can see my dog has ceased to be okay. 
Um, and I think that's in part why I've done so much work on racial justice uh, is because the fullness of who I am is a person of color. And I, because I am able to perceive all of the ways in which uh, the lives of people of color are stunted and the lives of white people are stunted because of white supremacy. That's partly why I do this work because I'm like, well, that shouldn't be this way. Right. Uh, and that's partly why I really like to work with people in their discernment processes, whether they're thinking divinity school or seminary or something else, um, because we all have uh, something that we're meant to do that makes us come alive. And sometimes that dovetails with education or dovetails with a quote unquote career, something that pays the bills. And sometimes it's something that we work so we can pay the bills so we can do. And in a lot of ways, being able to do what makes us come alive is such a privilege and a gift. So right. that's why I'm here. That last thing you said, it sort of hit me in the center of the chest for some reason. And I've, I've experienced that with you, that um, um, what came to mind is um, some of the solidarity work, I think, particularly got people know about in, let's say, Central America or other places where, let's say, um, what is it? I um, can't remember the name of the organization. It's really famous for sort of showing up to be present in communities where there's violence happening. Um, because of their white privilege or, you know, Western privilege, then it's less likely to happen. I feel like you're somebody who walks in solidarity with others, Laura. I mean, um, so many different types of people. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and I feel like that is, you know, the kind of work you do in, in leadership you were just mentioning. I mean, what a brave person to co-chair per capita. <laughs> <laughs> uh, kind of uh, work. I mean, it's because I feel like you are, you want to help um, people come alive and figure that, figure that out. Um, and I feel like you've landed in a great space to do that. I remember uh, also in your work with the Forum for Theological Exploration at FTE, I mean, similar kind of things, the work with um, other organizations uh, at McCormick um, and in other places, you that that's that that is consistent. I've experienced you that way in every context, um, and helping others flourish um, is is so important to you. And and you're right, not every it is a privilege. I mean that that is a real privilege, which speaks to the book and the topic. Yeah, only because uh, of sin is it a privilege, right? <laughs> to be clear. This is yeah. a reform principle, right? It's a very reform principle. Um, I love in the introduction, is it the introduction or the foreword, Otis Moss the third, who is at uh, Trinity UCC writes, um, America is in need of anti-racism activists, preachers and thinkers um, who are not people of color, but desire voices with a moral center that dare to speak truth to power and walk humbly with God. I feel like you're, the kind of person who helps folks like me and others find our voice and our action. But I feel like you are someone who consistently does um, dare to speak truth to power and, and walk humbly. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm you, grateful. Know, you know, of course, I think it's because of gender and race that I'm mm -hmm. able to do that. And because mm -hmm. of where I've, I really like to have jobs, <laughs> places that pay my bills, um, in organizations that allow me to be fairly fearless. Uh, and so that's partly why I'm here, that I feel like uh, Vanderbilt Divinity, they know who I am and mm -hmm. that's okay with them, mm -hmm. uh, which I know a lot of people are not in that position. Right. But I also think because I'm a woman and I'm very cisgender and I think even though I'm queer, sometimes people read me as straight which uh, is always sort of entertaining to me. But that, I mean, okay, whatever, you know, people see what they wanna see. And because I'm biracial Asian American and white Jewish, that for some reason, this is like a less threatening presentation to people. Mm -hmm. And I've learned how to be kind of diplomatic. So I feel like if people can hear me, mm -hmm. um, which is uncomfortable sometimes because I'm not the, per the only person they should be listening to, right. but, if I can help amplify or help raise points that people are unable to hear from other people, then it's something that I can contribute and then hopefully get people to the point where they don't have to come to me as an interpreter of what's going on. They can just 
have actual accountable relationships with a lot of different kinds of people. Yeah, it's like you bring those people together to have that. <laughs> These are conversations you need to be having. You need to be doing this on work, this work yourself. You're you, you were talking as we came on. Um, we're both Gen Xers, but I'm sort of, I'm a, I guess I'm a Xumer, and you're more of an X X Enial or something like that. Um, and you're, so, I haven't thought about. It. You really are that kind of. Um, bridge, threshold um, kind of person and who you are. And I'll say this, you know, I remember Katie Cannon talking about, um, you know, when she was discerning, you know, creating what is now womanist theology, um, uh, being at this, that she was encouraged not just to write about Bonhoeffer and Bard and all the white guys, um, but to write her own story, but she read them and knew them as, and I feel like you're one of those people that you understand kind of a lot about white culture and a lot about those white, you know, theologians and that sort of dominant and, you know, privileged sort of places. But um, that's not where you stop. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. You know, I'm a little bit proud that I've never read Bart. <gasps> what? Or what? Tillich. What? I'm fine with it because clearly I've absorbed <laughs> the white theology anyway, right? Exactly. But I do so appreciate when I was um, in seminary uh, that the core texts were not only the dead white guys, it was much more a more diverse compilation. And I think because I would have been upset if I'd gone somewhere, I mean, I chose where I went very deliberately because right. I, I would have been upset if I'd had to read only those voices right. because my life is not only those voices. None of our lives are, honestly, and if our lives are, that's very curious to me. <laughs> Um, but to always, it's to always have all of these different voices. Uh, I think it helps to be curious. So I'm not always great about asking questions, but I feel like when someone brings something to my attention, I'm at least able to refocus and integrate, um, new learnings and different perspectives to better nuance what I think and know, which I think is the task of a decent person especially a decent minister. Right. Yeah. yeah. Faithful. I mean, it's faithful. Um, and it's that, I think that's really helpful. Um, uh, which speaks to kind of this, this book. I mean, this is sort of the second edition in a way. I mean, it's, it's heavily revised. Uh, you can talk to us about the difference. The first one was raced in a post Obama America, but this one, it, it, it started out in the thoughtful Christian, maybe it's the third life of this, but I was reading, I didn't realize it started at McCormick Seminary, your MDiv alma mater in 2008, I think I read with just some conversations among others. And, and even the books, you sort of are bringing those voices out. And there's some new voices in this one that aren't in the, the earlier book. Um, how, how did this all get started? Um, what was those, those first conversations like? Yeah, this is a David Maxwell concept. So when he was editor of the Thoughtful Christian, there were these study packs and he thought, let's do a series on racism. And so he talked to a lot of different people, but there was a core group at McCormick that he talked to. Um, at that point, there was a really diverse group of faculty and staff. And uh, we came together and chatted through some things and ended up contributing several pieces, mm -hmm. which then he revised and I helped him a little bit uh, in 2015. And so it came out in 2016, I think, um, the post Obama book. Uh, but then obviously 2016 happened <laughs> and then the Trump era um, and a lot of us moved on and the thinking, of course, continued to evolve. Uh, and the first edition like didn't include really anything about Black Lives Matter because all of that had just started bubbling up. And the Trump era was just such a different way of experiencing white supremacy in the U.S. for some people. I think for other people, I didn't really notice it, <laughs> but for some people it just felt very different. Um, and I think a new willingness to engage on the part of dominant culture people. And so uh, Bob Ratcliffe came to me and asked if I would co-edit, so revise, add some new content. Like I replaced most mentions of African-American with black capital B. It's just like, it's a style difference. Um, there's a whole new chapter on Black Lives Matter 
there's a whole chapter on Trump's America, Trumpism, just because that is so very different. That would surprise me, but I was happy to see it. Like, you know, let's think theologically about this, not just politically, socially, et cetera. So I think because great. white supremacy, right, as we've experienced it, is so blatantly theologically grounded, mm -hmm. uh, especially now with, uh, I think we're more honestly talking about how white evangelicalism and fundamentalism have their basis in white supremacy doctrines. And um, we in the main lines have plenty of responsibility around our upholding of participating in creating white supremacy. Uh, and I really like that I actually work in a place that continues to sharpen my analysis, like along with being married to someone who does this for yeah. a living and we're trapped together in a pandemic. Yeah. So it's all I hear all day long. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm thinking, I mean, I'm thinking Emily Towns, um, mm -hmm. just, just to start, you know, who's your Dane. Yeah. I'm such a, such a huge fan. Um, and so many others. Um, yeah. Like the Floyd Thomases are here. It's just like a great wealth of very sophisticated, uh, right. conversation right. about Tennessee, white supremacy here. Nashville, Tennessee. How about that? <laughs> I know. I know. I always re remind people. Nashville also is like home to a black, you know, power base. There's HBCUs here and oh, Fisk yeah. University. Yeah. Right. John Lewis, you know, yeah. came to Fisk and 100 percent Jim Lawson got expelled from Vanderbilt for doing his good work and they have since apologized. Things are happening. Indeed. It's not just country music. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the Grand Ole Opry. There, well, yeah. You know, there's in, so interesting that that context we could talk a lot about that but um the white church i mean in, in the main line we have so much work to do and this feels like it was written that i think you said yeah it could be a just you in, individually read it and i got benefit just reading on my own but i think reading it with others is sort of how it's designed small groups or trusted groups um, what have you it's it's really set up that way and it's a manageable it was that was the aim as as I get yeah yeah mm -hmm. it's kind of my uh, well I think it was it's always been David Maxwell's desire that all of this work be accessible to people even if they haven't had a bunch of fancy master's degrees or have done much reading in right. like the humanities or uh, critical race theory so the idea is that it's grounded in really solid th theory. Um, and it escapes the binary thinking. So it's really inclusive of how white supremacy operates in the US, which there are a lot of different groups of people of color who are impacted, uh, but it has to be accessible to people. Um, education, it turns out, does not solve the problems of racism, but to have more and more people aware of it, I think that's really what happened around the murder of George Floyd. Like there's no denying you know, right. when you watch that, which I had a lot of trouble watching it even once. Yeah. Um, but I think so many people were are just in a really different space to acknowledge what has always been. And so this is, I feel like, kind of a user-friendly but not dumb down. Well, um, and what I, as I read it, too, is why, why would you do this in a group? It's not just like it's set up for small group study is because ultimately, and I, we heard this a couple of weeks ago from a guest, Chris Hong is, and I hear it in the book too, is ultimately this is not just something that happens in your head. It happens in your heart, but it also happens in your hands and your feet and your actions and your words. I mean, you got to get out and if you're really going to do the work, it, it's not going to just be reading a book. You know, the book becomes a, a launching pad and encouragement helps you put together sort of the, some tools, some, you know, um, so you're nodding along. So I've, I've, I've heard it, read it, read it right. I mean, which is important. I think that's important for people to hear because a lot of folks are like, I don't know what to do. Well, you could start right. here. If you don't. <laughs> yeah. And I think um, that kind of paralysis that people get into where they just feel trapped in, well, I don't know enough. Like, yeah, none of us do. Right. <laughs> that's, that's the point. Okay. Yeah. And that knowing, as you say, is not just in your head. It has to be in your heart, it has to be in your body, it has to be in your relationships. Mm -hmm. And the only way to do that is to allow yourself to get uncomfortable and get out there and make mistakes. It's terrible. Like I've had plenty of bad experiences too, but it provided me with learning and helped me grow an accountable relationship 
And I also don't think there's any one book that's like the book. I think if you choose one and you stop there, you have done yourself a great disservice mm -hmm. along with everyone else. There's always more to learn. Um, and so I feel like it's, I mean, you can read things and you can also do things and you can apologize and repair if you make mistakes, right. but it seems worse to just sit somewhere and read and, uh, not engage the work. And I don't mean that like you have to be out all the time. Like I know there are right. different abilities and different ways to engage, but to keep it all internal, I think is, uh you'll miss out on the integration right. of the work. Right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think um, it's, and it's not just about kind of being on the protest line. I mean, yeah, I think that's one thing, but it's, it's more um, when you were, when you mentioned the word repair, I kind of went right to reparations and I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, it's also in your checkbook and your budget, <laughs> right? How you spend your money. Um, I think that's, so how you spend your time and your relationships. I mean, those are, are all. Well, I kind of think it's like spiritual gifts, right? We all have different spiritual gifts. So some people, they absolutely need to be out there on the protest line. That's what they do best. Yes. Uh, and there are other people who might only do that occasionally, but they're really good at policy. And yeah. there are other people who it's like, oh, they don't have any policy access or expertise, but they could show up at a city hall meeting and basically slam the budget plans for overfunding the police and underfunding social services, which has a disproportionate impact on people of color. Right. Or you can just talk to your neighbors or your family members. Uh, so we all enter this work at different points. It's like laborers in the vineyard. Sure, I might complain a little bit if you're the 5 p.m. arrivals, but we need the 5 p.m. arrivals as well. Um, yeah, and there's just so many ways to engage it. Some people write, some people read. Some people teach, some people protest. Some people edit books and help other right. people discern. Yeah, <laughs> uh, by the way, Mark Peake, Jen James, you're one of your close friends there in Nashville, Elizabeth Colwell, also who teaches as a visiting professor at Vanderbilt, all giving uh, shout outs and giving thanks for your, for your leadership. Uh, Roy Howard, uh, Charles Smith. So um, thank you all, good to see you. Um, um, so, um, Laura, what do you think, what's sort of next for you? I mean, when you think about some of this work and I mean, you're not done, probably the book was done some time ago. Um, I mean, what, what does this mean for you, you know, going forward? I mean, what, what is, you know, and, and how can we, how can others support your work? Let's maybe put it that way. How, how can we amplify your voice? I love Hannah Bonner. Uh, who's a United Methodist minister, did this ministry called, Amp I think it was called Amplify or The Shout, where she brought spoken word people together, um, particularly who were marginalized voices to amplify. How can we amplify your voice? Because it needs to be amplified. <laughs> I kind of think like we take turns, right? So there are some places where we need to make sure that the voices of people who really need to be heard are heard. So I kind of feel like it's all in relationship, and if we're able to build solid relationships, then we're able to amplify each other's voices when it's most appropriate. Um, I think what can be challenging for some of us is to remember that white supremacy is operating on all of us all of the time. Mm. And so it's not a matter of, well, it's like how things happen cascading on top of each other. Mm. Uh, and so are we going to forget about anti-Asian and especially um, sexualized violence against Asian American women and Asian women because there's this other mass shooting? And are we going to forget about like Sikh Americans uh, and South Asians? Mm. And are we going to forget about Black Lives Matter? Like, no, we have to remember that it's all happening all the time. Mm. And so it's very appropriate to continue to amplify one another's voices. Mm. Like, I'm happy to come speak and all of that, but there are a lot of people who are good at that. Right. Yeah. That's, well, that means, and, and I hear you also saying, like, we may not personally be able to do everything about all those things because it's happening all the time every day, and we don't even hear it, not even probably an iceberg worth of everything that's going on, right? Uh, it's probably happening in our neighborhood. Uh, low, it, it, not probably, it is. Um, so it's, 
Uh, I hear you saying there's there's plenty to do, but don't get overwhelmed. Do what you can do with the gifts you have with some intention. You know, right? Some wise person, and it honestly might have been my mother, <laughs> said, uh, you're not Jesus. Jesus already was, you know, murdered. <laughs> right. um, the overly simplistic substitutionary penal atonement version would be Jesus already died for our sins, so you don't have to do it too. But I just think like, Just because uh, someone was sacrificed for the empire doesn't mean that we're the martyr to come. Mm, mm -hmm. That's not necessarily our role. Right. Uh, And if we do that to ourselves by overwork, it may actually be a matter of ego instead Mm. of community accountability. Mm. So I'm hearing in there, like set some bounds, some healthy boundaries there too. Cause it's like, you could not stop once you get in um, the swamp. I mean, the swamp just goes on and on and on. Um, yeah. Which is not healthy uh, for anybody involved. You know um, I want to go back to this, my, this thing about solidarity and you spoke about uh, Jessica, your, your partner, uh, I, I know in my case with Elizabeth too, like part of the reason I'm able to keep going and doing anything that maybe occasionally is faithful is because I have people that walk alongside me. I mean, where, where are the places that you're finding people walking with you and alongside you, your colleagues, it sounds like, um, your partner, um, probably others um, that you're reading or watching? I, I, I don't know. Um, So the two books I'm working my way through super slowly for whatever reason, I don't know why in the pandemic I'm having difficulty reading, um, is Anthea Butler, Why Evangelical Racism. Uh, We went ahead and started rebuilding our library and updating it just because a lot of our stuff is from the, you know, good 90s and early 2000s. And then I'm also reading the latest theological education book by Willie James Jennings in part because... I'm a huge fan, (laughs) but also because it's really, really good. So those are two folks. Uh, I'm also working with some Vanderbilt University, Asian, Asian American and Pacific Islander staff and faculty, uh, just because like we need each other. Um, There are not very many of us. At some point, my colleague was looking through the contact pages of every single school at Vanderbilt University just to find (laughs) the other Asian Americans. Um, for solidarity purposes. And I think because um, the Divinity School has such a long history of Black church studies and accountable relationships with the different um, Black church communities, that then that is another level of accountability along with just like every day I talk to friends who are Native American, Indigenous, um, who are Asian American. I have white friends. Um, and who are black and Latino. It's just a part of my own life. Um, And I don't want to use those folks for accountability, but because those are the natural relationships that have been built, I think then they end up being accountable. Mm. Um, Yeah, so earlier you were talking about relationships, but now uh, you you went from uh, just being friendly to meddling a little bit, but in a good way. I mean, if you're in actual authentic relationship, I hear you talking about there is accountability in those relationships where I have a responsibility to you and you have a responsibility to me. And and I have always felt that with you. I mean, I feel like, uh, you know, willingness to be honest and truthful and forthright, even if it's Can not. Can I tell easy. you things? You're one. Of, I, I think that actually is one of your greatest gifts. I mean, it's almost Southern in a way, like a Southern grandmother who can like. (laughs) uh, Japanese Americans and Southerners have a lot in common. (laughs) Like you can say, that's so nice when that's, the words don't really mean anything. (laughs) Um, I can't believe our time is gone away here. I apologize if I didn't acknowledge anybody out there. Thanks you all for being here. Continue to follow Laura. Really, I encourage you to, to order the book. Um, great contributors here. I mean, David Esterline, Jennifer Harvey, Kimberly Jackson, O'Smalls, Smalls, Deb Mumford. I mean, Amari uh, Tanton Santos, uh, Jessica v- Vasquez Torres. I mean, it's unbelievable. Frank Yamada, it's, it's incredible. Um, and um, 
Laura, continue to stay in touch and let us know how we can support you. Um, I'm going to invite you to give us a charge of benediction, if you're willing, um, after I invite folks to come back uh, in two weeks, May 5th, which is um, our next guest is uh, Patrick Reyes. He is so awesome. It's his, I think his second book, his first one, also awesome. I think I had nearby, The Purpose Gap, Empowering Communities of Color to Find Meaning and Thrive. We'll be talking about his book and that ministry. It's really super deal. That's, that's kind of another great book to kind of pick up. Um, you're making me think I need to invite Willie Jennings, though, because that is is off the hook. Um, it's over on my other stack of here. <laughs> uh, or I'd pick that up. Great book. Um, but come back on May 5th. Uh, we'll we'll be having that. Laura, would you uh, be willing to to bless us and thank you again for what you do, but even more importantly, who you are, your witness, um, your truth, <laughs> your joy, your love, um, your grace, your wisdom, um, your willingness to be that kind of bridge person. Um, and uh, take care of yourself, please. Stay healthy. <laughs> um, just love being a part of, of your world. And I know I'm just speaking for a chorus of others and saying the very same thing. So thank you so much. And again, for today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so this is going to be a, a charge, maybe. Uh, it's going to be very Laura style, probably. Um, <clears throat> everything is terrible, like all the time. But everything is wonderful most of the time, too. And so always keep that sense of the wonder mm -hmm. and be fueled by the understanding that too many people are robbed of that wonder. Mm -hmm. And that's our work, is to make it possible for everyone to experience the wonderful that God has put into this world and to participate in that. So even if you need to take a break, hydrate, rest, Got to get back up, go back out there, do the work. Amen. Do the work. Hydrate. That's so important. <laughs> um, friends, we'll look forward to seeing you soon. And thanks again, Laura. Mm -hmm.